welcome back to the next Petman Academy musicianship class. Um, we're staying online for at least the next um, few weeks. Um, slight change of plan. Um, so last time I saw you, I spoke um, about Beethoven and we looked at his symphonies. And in the next couple of weeks, we are going to work our way back towards Beethoven and indeed beyond. Um, but today we're going to go a bit further back in time. And we're going to look at the history of an instrument that I'm sure you're all familiar with you. Many of you play it. Um, and that, of course, is the piano. Um, a lot of you know the instrument and play it very, very well. Um, but many of you may not know the long and very interesting history behind the piano or keyboard instruments. So today I'm going to go back several centuries to look at how the piano developed over time and ended up in the form that we know it today. So let's get started. So I'm just going to go into the PowerPoint. I'm going to share my screen with you. So just bear with me again. Here we go. So into the PowerPoint and from the beginning. Okay, so the piano can go from something as delicate and elegant as this. something as thunderous sounding as this. For us, an instrument that, of course, we all know and recognize the piano. And it's so common that we may not often stop to think how it got here. And we could be forgiven for simply assuming that it's always been the same, it's always looked and sounded the same. But that is not the case. So today I'm going to explore just what a long history lies behind the development of this instrument. We're going to answer questions such as Has it always looked the same? Was it always this size? Was its case always so strong? Did it always have the same number of keys? Were its strings always arranged in the same way? And to all of these questions, if the answer is no, then why not? And even today, there's numerous different types of piano. We have the humble upright, which used to be in almost every home in Western Europe. The modest baby grand. The more impressive concert grand piano. Liberace's grand piano with mirrors. The plastic or perspex grand, which is a bit horrifying, but also looks quite cool, I think. And then we have Michael Pariakovai's um, beautiful carved red grand piano. And that's, of course, not even counting the electronic synthesizer. The history of instruments and instrument making is fascinating, and I could fill several classes with this. And the piano is, of course, just one of the many types of instrument. Time dictates that we're going to focus on the development of the keyboard. And from now on, I'm going to use the word keyboard rather than piano. But it's also an instrument that's tremendously important, so it merits our attention. The development of any musical instrument is reflected in numerous conditions, including the economic environment, technology and inventions, social conditions, musical and compositional factors, the availability and source of patronage, for example, a church, a court, or private wealth, and the size and acoustic of venues. 
we're going to look at the story of keyboard instruments from their early history through to their more recent developments. And I'll spend the next two to three of these musicianship classes discussing the piano with you. The world's first known keyboard instrument was a water organ, also called a hydraulis. It was described in the third century by Tsetsibis of Alexandria. Water coursing downwards through a conduit compresses air that's released through the different pipes of the organ, making a sound just like when you blow into a flute or a recorder. It doesn't have a tiny little keyboard though, because the keys were as much as a foot wide, and they were to be played with your fists, your feet, and even your knees. It had a range of about two octaves and didn't have any chromatic keys, that's the black notes on a piano. It wasn't until the 14th century that all of those chromatic notes were available on keyboard instruments. We also have ancient plans for a wind-powered organ. I'm not exactly sure how this worked, but presumably the spinning wheel kept pressure on the wind chest, which delivered air under pressure to the pipes. The first keyboard instrument to arrive in Western Europe was also an organ. It was a gift from Emperor Constantine to King Pepin of the Franks in 757 AD. More than a musical instrument, it was also a symbol of technological advancement and of wealth. And where better to show it off than in a church? Indeed, by the end of the first millennium, the organ had already earned itself a place in liturgical music and was found in many churches. Some of you may know that St Cecilia, the patron saint of music, is usually depicted playing the organ. From around 1400, new keyboards began to emerge, with sound produced not by air, but with strings. And it's this type of keyboard instrument that we're going to examine today. The earliest of these was called the clavichord. The clavichord has quite a simple mechanism. So a key on a keyboard looks short, but it's in fact longer than it looks. A key is a little bit like a seesaw. So when you press down on a key on a clavichord, its back end rises up, and on that is a small piece of metal called a tangent that hit the string. Actually, it's a pair of strings strung at the same pitch. It made a pretty noise, but a very quiet one, so it's no good for accompanying others. The clavichord therefore hid somewhat in the shadows due to the preference of the harpsichord, which was much louder. But the clavichord may have been used a bit more than we think. It survived a long time and was used as a practice instrument by many musicians. Apparently Mozart and Chopin took clavichords with them when they were traveling so that they could practice. And it's possible, for instance, that J.S. Bach wrote the well-tempered clavier for the clavichord. Here's some music by the English Renaissance composer William Byrd played on a clavichord. also had a feature that no other keyboard instrument has. You can actually create a sort of vibrato called vibon, because it used that basic seesaw mechanism. If you kept your finger down on the key, the tangent would stay pressed against the string, which meant you could move your finger up and down on the key, and the tangent would push and relax the string. But the clavichords, as I've said, was a very quiet instrument, so in fact quite a personal one, and it was a favourite instrument of Carl Philipp Emanuel. Bach. I'll show you an example of their bun. Just bear with me.
clavichord does have a super simple mechanism, but it really makes too little sound for it to be of much use when there's an audience of more than one. And the need for more volume led to the development of the harpsichord. The harpsichord created more sound because it was played by plucking the strings. And the harpsichord was the dominant keyboard instrument from the 16th through to the 18th centuries. So rather than have something hit the string, harpsichords had a little device, a bit like a plectrum, that you would pluck the string when the key was struck, much in the same way as you use a plectrum or long fingernails on a guitar. And it's the plucking that gives this instrument its jangly quality. So here's an example from Henry Purcell's Suite No. 3 in G major. <laughs> Like that sound or not, harpsichords could be very beautifully painted. What you can see in these photos is that these harpsichords have two different keyboards, or in the technical jargon, they have two manuals. Although harpsichords often had only a single manual, many had two and some even had three. There are reasons for this, but first I should explain a little how a harpsichord works. So, Inside the harpsichord are metallic strings. They run directly away from the player in line with the keys. The higher notes have shorter strings and the lower notes have longer strings, the same as in a grand piano, which is what gives it that shape. The string is what makes the sound when it vibrates. What causes it to vibrate is the plectrum or quill attached to a piece called the jack. This sits below the string and when you press the key, the jack rises up and the plectrum plucks the string. Now this works because pressing the key has the same seesaw effect that we saw in the clavichord. The last piece of equipment is the damper, and each string has its own damper, which dampens, or muffles if you like, the sound, and it sits on the string at all times, except for when you press the key down. At that point, it's lifted off the string. It will stay off the string and let it vibrate until you release the key at which point it goes back to sit on the string and kills the sound. Here's a diagram. Now the one drawback of the harpsichord action is that you can't control the volume. Once you've pressed the key, the mechanism lets the jack fly and at that point it's all out of your control. So that's where the double manual keyboard comes in. It doesn't just have two manuals, it also has two strings per note or sometimes more, each with its own jack. The lower manual will activate the jacks on all the strings, thus making more sound. The upper manual will only cause one of the strings to be plucked, thus making less sound. In this way, players could achieve contrasts and dynamics. Here, for instance, is a piece by J.S. Bach called the Italian Concerto, where he specifies which hand is played on which manual. Now, in a concerto, we'd normally expect an orchestra but here, Bach creates the same sense of contrast between tutti and solo by varying the manuals. So here's a bit of a video with a bit of a description beforehand. Bach admired the work of the Italian composers very much, and he copied a lot of their pieces. He would take a violin concerto and arrange it for solo keyboard. And there's a volume of, of pieces which you can get uh, that he's done that are like this. But then I suppose he got the idea to compose his own concerto in the Italian style in which he's mimicking a violin soloist with orchestra. Because believe it or not, in those days, there were no keyboard concerti, only violin concerti. In fact, Bach was one of the first ones to write a keyboard. He was the only, he was the first one. He wrote the Brandenburg concertos and he wrote many concertos for harpsichord that could also be played on the violin, but he was primarily a keyboard player. I think he was very interested in the instrument. So in this concerto in the Italian style, he 
tries to simulate the tutti or the whole orchestra playing and the soloist. And he does this by indicating where to play loud and where to play soft. He does it in a very detailed manner. Essentially, when he writes the F, meaning forte, that means I have to play on the lower keyboard, which is going to be a louder sound. And then the piano areas are going to be on the upper keyboard. And he's very specific about this, more specific than anyone before him and even some after him. This whole piece is quite unique from that point of view. He tells us exactly where he wants us to put our hands. is a fairly sizable instrument and obviously didn't fit into every home without taking up lots of space. Therefore, there are a few smaller variants, um, but they're all part of the same family. And these include the virginals, the musala, and the spinet. The first thing to notice about the virginals, which is called a pair of virginals, just like a pair of scissors, is that it doesn't have the elongated wing shape like a grand piano that the harpsichord has. And this is because um, its strings actually run parallel to the keyboard. This made it a much smaller instrument, especially in models that didn't have as many notes as a lot of the harpsichords, and thus suitable for domestic use. The one in the picture is a plain and simple English pair of virginals. Here's a more ornate version. And here's a virginal in a sewing box. William Byrd wrote some fantastic music for the virginals, so here's a little bit. was slightly different to the virginals. It was a word originally used to describe Flemish virginals, which had their keyboard on the right, thereby putting the plectra in the centre of the strings. Changing the whereabouts along the length of the string, the plectrum plucks make a difference to the sound. The musala was more resonant than the virginals, but you can hear the mechanical action more loudly. See if you can spot that in a bit more bird.
in the family is the spirit. These possibly arose in the early 17th century. Establishing a date of origin is tricky because the terms spinet and virginal were more or less used interchangeably in the past. And in the 15th and 16th centuries, the Italian word for the square virginal was a spinetta, just to confuse things even further. Today, we distinguish the spinet from other keyboard instruments because its strings go off on a diagonal from the keyboard. Also, while many harpsichords have two strings per note, spinets only have one. And some spinets took on an interesting shape, such as this one. Anyway, let's hear what it sounds like. particular instrument that you see on the screen here was made by, um, in 1693, by a certain Bartolomeo Cristofori, who becomes very important in our story at this point. Now we've already seen how the harpsichord and other members of its family gave the player almost no control over the volume. Cristofori proposed a different mechanism for keyboard instruments that would change all of that. Bartolomeo Cristofori was an instrument maker who worked at the court of the famous Medici family in Florence. His employer, Prince Ferdinando of Florence, was a fervent art collector, musician, and patron of music. He was responsible for introducing Cristofori to the Medici court in 1688. Ferdinando owned more than 40 harpsichords, spinets, and forte pianos. As well as being a talented instrument repairer, Cristofori constructed many new instruments. In 1698, he was permanently employed at the court, which might be connected with the assignment to build a forte piano, which was first described in the Medici's instrument inventory in 1700. Cristofori was a brilliantly original man who delighted in developing many types of unusually shaped and technically refined keyboard instruments in different variations. Many of the instruments he made have not survived until today, but his invention of the hammer action, which inspired today's pianos, changed the course of instrument building and the entire history of music. For Cristofori's instrument, which we today would call a forte piano, um, he did away with plucking the string and found a method instead for having a hammer strike the string. This uses the same sort of principle of hitting the strings of a dulcimer, an old instrument that we'll just briefly see in action here. His invention was called Grave Cimbalo Col Piano e Forte, meaning large keyboard instrument with loud and soft. Um, sorry, that's the wrong slide, my apologies. Um, here are the hammers that Cristofori built. Um, if you look inside a modern piano, you'll see that the hammer heads are considerably more substantial. Indeed, Cristofori's instrument was simple and plain, built entirely of wood, with no metal frame of any kind, unlike modern pianos. The hammer action is actually very complicated, and Cristofori's mechanism, though modified since his time, is still fundamentally the same as in modern pianos. The hammer lies underneath the string, and it rises to hit the string when you press the key. 
but the hammer also, crucially, gets out of the way very quickly once it's done its job, so that you can hit the key again. This is called an escapement mechanism, and it allows you to play the same note rapidly in succession. It was also designed in such a way that when the hammer retreated, it didn't rebound and bounce back onto the string accidentally. Though only a technical detail, this was a component of crucial significance in this new instrument. And you can see it in action here. Here we are. So Cristofori's invention was called Gravicembalo col piano e forte, which means large keyboard instrument with loud and soft, because a hammer action allowed you to control how hard you hit the string. If you gave the key a good whack, the note will be loud. If you gently touched it, the note will be soft. This gave it an expressive potential that the harpsichord just didn't have. Now you might ask, surely the clavichord could do the same? And the answer to that is yes, but was nowhere near the range of volume. The clavichord was a tiny instrument that made a tiny sound, but the forte piano was fairly loud. It had thicker, tenser strings than a harpsichord. It had two strings for each note, but hit by a single hammer. It produced a warm sound, and it had that effective escapement mechanism, and most importantly, it gave the player control over volume. Cristofori's surviving instruments are three of these forte pianos, two harpsichords, a clavichord, and one spinet. And on this slide is the earliest surviving forte piano of his, and it dates from 1720. It's also the oldest known surviving piano in the world. And this one can be found at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And this is what it sounds like. Hopefully you can hear the gentle swells of loud and soft volume. about the name, Gravicembalo col piano e forte, was eventually shortened to pianoforte, literally meaning loud soft, and then to piano. The word forte piano, which I've been using, was coined a bit later, simply in order to distinguish these early pianos from their larger, more powerful descendants. So 18th century pianos are called forte pianos, and modern ones are called pianofortes, and the modern ones, of course, we now call piano for short. Being able to play something, play with a nuanced range of dynamics, i.e. volume, should have been something you think that everybody wanted. But the instrument did take some time to gain in popularity, and it happened at different times in different countries. After all, why would people get rid of their trustworthy harpsichords and risk a lot of money on this newfangled gravicembalo called piano e forte? Indeed, numerous composers went on to publish pieces which they advertised as being written for the harpsichord or pianoforte. The fact that this catchphrase was printed on scores even from the end of the 18th century shows clever business acumen. If potential customers of sheet music only owned a harpsichord and not a forte piano, then there was no point losing out on their money just because of that. So harpsichords died hard, it seems. In Spain, three Cristofori forte pianos 
even suffered the ultimate indignity of being converted into harpsichords. Dr. Charles Bernay remarks on one of the reasons why the forte piano took a long time to become widely adopted, namely that it needed music that was composed especially for it and could capitalize on its ability to play both loud and soft. When you listen to a piece like this next one, you could be excused for thinking it wouldn't lose much for being played on a harpsichord. Although it's fantastic music, there's not really a huge range of loud and soft playing. they were slow to take off was that they were very costly and to make and therefore expensive to buy. They were really owned by royalty and very wealthy people. The castrato singer Farinelli owned one that he inherited from Queen Maria Barbara of Spain. But one innovation that did help the forte piano to break into the domestic market was the square piano. Dating back to the 1760s, these were simpler. Some of the early ones even lacked that escapement me mechanism, and they were cheaper and so became very popular. A leading manufacturer was Johannes Zumper, who worked in England. Their popular acceptance in the end not only made Zumper's fortune, but most significantly helped the forte piano displace the harpsichord as the dominant keyboard instrument. But this is by no means the end of our story, for our modern piano is different to these early pianos. The forte piano has leather-covered hammers, while the modern piano's hammers use felt. On a modern piano, the strings are much thicker. The modern piano has a more solid case that's made of thicker wood. Also, the frame, that's what the strings are attached to, is metal in a modern piano or wooden forte piano. Now, at first, the forte piano was only about four octaves in range, which gradually increased to five octaves around Mozart's time, later, for Beethoven to a six octave span, and then later in the 19th century, the piano acquired its full seven and a half octaves. These differences in construction result in the forte pianos having a softer tone than its modern counterpart with less sustaining power. By that, I mean that when you hit a note, it will ring on for longer on a modern piano. This means that the forte piano has more of a bell-like percussiveness to it. Different parts of the keyboard have a fairly similar sound quality on modern pianos, but the bass register of a forte piano is sort of fuzzy, but also clear, and therefore sounds rather noble. The higher parts of the keyboard have a tinkly quality to them, and then the middle range, on the other hand, is much more rounded and probably closest to a modern piano sound. So let's have a listen just to finish up to the difference. We're going to hear two recordings of a sonata um, by Joseph Haydn, who we of course met a few weeks ago in my Sturman Krang class. As you probably know, Haydn was a rich, highly successful, popular and influential composer who worked for the immensely rich court of the Eszterházy family in what was then the Austro-Hungarian Empire. When comparing the old forte pianos with the modern piano, it's not a case of one being superior and the other inferior. They are different, and perhaps you'll have your own preference. Usually it's the pianist that's more important than the piano in influencing opinion. And even so, in the recording we're about to hear that's played on the modern piano, the performer has evidently thought about how it could have sounded when Haydn played it on his own forte piano and tried to recreate something of that on his modern instrument. So here's... Um, part of the sonata number 50, the third movement, um, played firstly on an old forte piano.
and now plays on the modern piano. I'm sure you'll have your own preferences there. So that brings us to the end of, the, of this session. Um, but next time I see you on again on video, we'll look at how the piano developed beyond um, the late 18th century, moving towards what Mozart did with the piano, Beethoven and Schubert. So I'll see you online next time. Thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs>